maybe this is maybe this is better as a um, uh, as a, into a conversation rather than a uh, the seminar because I mean it's the uh, I sort of want to you know, get to get something off my chest um, after I guess of, I guess of the gap of sort of ten years um, and just to throw in a um, throw in a few thoughts on this of the issue of you know, why why transitional justice never happened. Um, you know, rather than give us a fully sort of developed thesis and, and so on. Um, because, um, well, yeah, I hope like, that's pretty fair, that's, that's fair amongst, uh, amongst friends. I, I got some poetry ready. I think he'd been deprived of an inheritance by the British after the um, uh, after the, the mutiny in, uh, in India. And he spent a lot of his time going around seeking justice um, from a uh, sort of the, the deaf imperial authorities who would never grant him his just justice. Uh, and the, the the poet who wrote this one was clearly was echoed, he was clearly he was echoing the style of Valle and his pursuit of justice. Um, and I sat and translated this today because I thought it was probably the best way to. The best way to start. Of course, you can never you can never actually translate poetry because the play on this is um, that the this, 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 um, the security or peace that they're, they're talking about is Aman, is the word, and that they the, he's making a play on the name of somebody called Amanullah Kuzar, um, and also the the the, the, the wayfarers of Kuzar. You know, lots of people, Afghans in public life always have epithets for names, so that the um, Amanullah Kuzar is so Amanullah is the, the way the, the Amanullah the wayfarer. Um, uh, and of course, the, the poet is making um, making a play. Of, you know, we asked you for we asked you for for peace, and you gave us somebody whose name is Peace, but actually not a very peaceful man. Um, uh, and uh, and of course, uh, yeah, when he uh, when he when he talks about the Democrats, the Democrats is a sort of a, a, an almost. Um, it's almost a term of abuse now. In the set. It's, a, it's, a, it's a highly ironic term um, for, the, uh, for those uh, who were sort of, um, the, sort of, you know, the proponents of a, uh, a Western-oriented democratic model uh, for Afghanistan. And there's a sense that you know, they never managed to pull anything off. And of course, as, people, as the, the term accumulated more meaning as the years went on, and Democrats seemed to claim to be associated not with those who um, f uh, who um, advocated a certain model of electoral democracy, but it's those who um, insisted on drinking alcohol and you know, pursued all forms of moral corruption. I mean, it's really is a, a really nasty term of abuse now to describe someone as a Democrat. Um, although sometimes amongst friends it can be, yes, you know, will, you know, you know, will you have a drink with me? Are you a Democrat? Yeah. Um, uh, but this, the, uh, the, the poet is conveying the sense that so what we thought we were going to get um, in this period from uh, from 2001, you know, the democracy, um, that you know the dream has passed. On the one hand, you have a return of the Taliban uh, through the uh, to the, the new conflict, and on the other hand, instead of the um, instead of the Democrats, you have again in the next the next play. Fahim, of course, is the, the name of the vice president now, uh, but in the, in the early stages, he was the the, the, the defense minister. Um, he's somebody uh, against. It. It's just not a, it's just not a sit in the back kind of kind of event today. <laughs> <laughs> 
so the, the play on the, the play on that, of course, is for him. His name means intelligent. Um, <laughs> so uh, this, I, this idea that in this in this new order, um, those who, uh, who call the shots have decided um, to, uh, actually to put the this intelligent person on top rather than pursue the path that the, the Democrats thought. Um, uh, and of course, another sort of, uh, you know, sort of important reference to the themes of those who were uh, those who were uh, expecting that there would be some form of transitional justice after 2001. Um, and the poet jokes that about the only qualification that President Karzai had was at least you know, he never held a um, uh, the kind of position in which he could have actually killed anyone, done anyone, had no blood on his hands. Um, uh, however, and I'd say, but and. In sense, was reluctantly accepting that at least that's a break with the past. Um, uh, but of course, the the, uh, you know, the poet says that's you know, that's not enough. Just having somebody with clean hands on the top uh, is not enough. Uh, if the dynamics of the uh, the palace are such, that the only way to be able to get yourself into a position of authority is to do all of these things. Um, uh, and there's a clear there's a clear reference back. To He, Ghali, you know, Ghali writes about don't ask, don't, uh, don't ask for for justice um, you know, from the English. It's just, you might as well ask for justice from stone. Um, uh, the uh, the anonymous poet um, is essentially saying the same of the uh, people, people out of Paris. And I mean, I sort of to the reason that I sort of throw this up to st to to start uh, is because in two thousand and one, when you'd had this. Yeah, uh, there was this weird sort of Deus Ex Machina of the um, uh, the, the U.S.-led military action that pushed the Taliban out, and the sense that something new was going to uh, was going to happen. Um, in the uh, in the early days after um, the, after the Taliban fled, uh, any of us who were um, you know, going into going into Kabul, so our, our way in was through Bagram Air Base because for a while the um, Kabul Air um, and, uh, and so you land, you land in Bagram Air Base, and then you drive into you drive into Khan. And on the way, uh, one of the I mean the, you know, the the weirdest sights on the way in, at least for the uh, the first um, uh, week or two after the Taliban fled, um, was there was a there was a corpse which had been sort of lynched um, f uh, from I guess from a tree the side of a military post there on the main road. Um, uh, some, you know, some poor town that didn't manage to get away. Um, and the, the guy who was running, the, uh, running that post just insisted on displaying this, um, this macabre trophy uh, of the capture of the Shamali planes north of Kabul um, uh, from the Taliban. Um, the person who ran that post was the same person around who the first, the first stanza the uh, the person who um, uh, who subsequently I mean, and again the the, uh, uh, the one who occasioned the writing of this poem uh, when President Karzai decided that he must be appointed as the police chief of the capital um, the kind of uh, the kind of um, testimony which I picked up and just um, picked up in, in, in all my um, in all the sort of assignments that I've had in various the various different one part of it has just been sitting down with Afghans and just taking a note of what they have to say. Um, the kind of testimony we have over um, 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 the range between so the, the almost banal to the, I mean, the seriously bloodthirsty. I mean, banal along the line, but I mean, somebody who just had, had been disappeared for a few days and actually forced him in the, uh, you know, held, held in some undisclosed place and like made to polish shoes or something weird like that because he happened to be and driving by when Amalul Gazar was trying to you know, was sort of driving out, out of his drive, and obviously interfered in sort of the smooth flow of traffic in some such a way, and so Amalul's gunmen picked him up and yeah, dragged him off from somewhere and, and, and arbitrarily detained him, um, but, but did let him did let him out. Um, to we had uh, um, testimony from Tagal, one of the districts in the north of, north of Kabul, where he before being appointed police chief, 
and he led a militia which was involved in some executions of the population there. There's, there's an old, yeah, there were various there were various reasons why they'd be involved in that. Um, there was an ethnic element to it. Um, and nowadays he's actually in Parliament. When we did get to the uh, one of the one of the sort of the, the one of the crunch points we actually did have little yeah, little glimmerings of transitional justice. Um, which I'll um, you know, mention again, we, we did actually have an attempt at police vetting, or at least uh, there were attempts that the, um, those who held um, senior office in the police force um, should be subject to review for their track record of um, human rights abuses and uh, narcotics links. Um, and I remember actually sitting in a, um, uh, sitting in one of those crunch meetings that you had with these of the all the security chiefs, the Afghan security chiefs, and various of the, um, the international figures sitting there. Uh, and uh, the, the president was basically wavering instead of saying, oh, he's a good person, we need this, yeah, good chap, we, we need him. And uh, my, my boss then saying, oh, my God, so what do we do? And uh, you know, basically, it was um, because they, the, 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 the hint that the president was giving was that a move against this man will trigger, you know, disorder, chaos, the whole thing will fall apart. Um, and I just said in the ear of my boss, he's got four wives, he's built a separate house in Kabul for every one of them. Uh, he has you know, acquired massive assets by grabbing the old Baba Jan uh, army division headquarters and carving up the land into plots and selling it off to people, making a huge amount of money. He can't afford to do that. <laughs> yeah, hold, hold your position. Um, and yeah, very, very rarely actually, he's one of these few, these few set pieces where I mean there was a genuine debate amongst the international, the international figures, the Afghan security chiefs, with the president, with the president of Afghanistan presiding, listened to the different sides, and he was swayed. And very briefly, this person was pushed out. Subsequently, the whole thing fell apart. But it's not the, it's not that they, um, it's not that the, there was like uh, rebellion in the streets. Um, it's the commitment to doing what. To do in terms of to build a clean police force that fell apart. So I mean that's in sort of how um, you know, um, you know that's that's how uh, how I felt as we drove into uh, into Kabul in 2001. The end, the end of December 2001, after the Taliban had been uh, pushed out. Um, but there were lots of hopes, uh, and the. Uh, I think this is the case study that I would give as to why there were so many hopes um, was because of some of the dreadful things which had happened um, only a few months before this. And that they, in the, uh, so the, uh, the case study that um, that I'd go back to would be the Akalai massacre, which happened in, um, in January of that year, um, when the you know, obviously U.S. was, of course, still completely uh, disengaged and. Uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, it's, it explains why, uh, why many Afghans and some of us internationals who were working, you know, working in Afghanistan um, felt that uh, you know, if the international community gets involved in Afghanistan, it's going to be on the side of justice. Um, they, if you want to, uh, to, you know, to read more about the Afghan message, it's written, written up quite a few times. There was a human rights watch report um, from, from the era. The reason that, I mean, that I was sort of Became involved because one of the, the hats I was wearing with the UN at that time was um, responsibilities of human, human humanitarian coordinator for the area. Um, I was the in charge of an office that was located in um, in Yakala and had a team there. The the anti-Taliban resistance had gone into action um, f uh, in the previous months. They'd been the yeah, other because uh, after the Taliban has sort of taken over that bit of the country which was um, not naturally receptive to them from 98, there have been a few sparks um, of resistance, sort of a, a, an attempt to recapture Bamiyan in, in 99, and then things have gone a little bit quiet sort of during much of, much of 2000, pinpricks. And then in the, um, in the winter of, uh, uh, of 2000, um, the the anti-Taliban resistance in the north started to try and expand their fronts. Um, and people joked about sort of the army of the snow, 
the feeling that they could only they could only manage to operate against the Taliban you know, on their home ground, unfamiliar territory for the Taliban in the you know, in the winter when things were covered with snow and they disappeared thereafter. Um, so on one level, they sort of weren't you know, they um, uh, they weren't taken seriously. I mean, they were joked about. Obviously, they said that the the army of the snow was a joke. Um, and a lot of us had um, uh, uh, you know, had experience of. Um, you know, places changing hands on a regular basis, and you know, Afghans knew how to cope with this. Um, and old Afghan hands amongst the foreigners thought they knew how to cope with it. And so, because I had a um, uh, an office and a team in um, in Yakalan, when we got when we got news that the the, you know, the army of the snow had pushed the Taliban out, um, for, I think it was back in December, I guess. The, um, you know, it wasn't such a big deal. We knew all the, we knew all the people on both sides. Um, uh, and it wasn't any great surprise when the Taliban put together a column and tried to, uh, to push them out. We actually thought the Taliban might have waited a little longer for the snow to disappear. Um, but apparently they were, and they were determined to um, uh, ensure that the, the, the army of the snow didn't last, didn't last for long. So it wasn't a big deal. And what I personally did as a, I mean, as an you know, old Afghan hat, I actually um, sat in one of the Taliban bases in, uh, in Kabul, um, one of the commanders who had. Um, who had troops who were in the uh, column that was going into Yakalan, um, so as to make arrangements for um, basically safely moving our UN team from the, you know, basically across the line, because obviously that they knew that the um, resistance would have to retreat, and Taliban would take the would take the place, um, and it would be sort of business as usual for a while, and um, we just always wanted to make sure that we had um, a reasonable reception from whoever were the day back to authorities um, in the area, and you knew that you knew that sort of things were going wrong. When, as I, I mean, you know, maintained the the, the the radio communication, the the team on the ground just kept they gave cryptic messages saying that you know basically so, yeah, stuff is happening here. We can't cross the line. Um, so I mean, always you want to um, uh, you know respect the, the judgment of the, uh, the people on the ground. To, to try to keep in uh, keep in touch, and didn't, didn't push them. But then, you know, within a day or two, it became clear that things were. Um, this was not just a normal um, sort of you know, handover responsibility in the area. Um, quite soon, um, uh, word you know, came back that there had been a lot of killing um, uh, in the place. Um, my my focus as a you know, as a UN official, of course, was then in terms of trying to get us and to get our team out. Um, we managed to make arrangements for. Not involve crossing the line that they said they, um, they couldn't. Um, uh, but then, so, you know, so after after um, a few days, we managed to get them to a place where we, they were reasonably reasonably secure. Um, <coughs> uh, but uh, then then words start coming out. We came out in a few other a couple of people gave sort um, of partial interviews from the area on, on, on radio, saying that there had been um, several hundred people who had been killed. And by the Taliban when they retook the place, um, and although I couldn't, I couldn't communicate freely with my team in the um, even so this the relatively secure place. Um, it was clear that some kind of a massacre had um, had happened. Um, so I was tasked to go and um, go and establish the facts, um, and it turned out to be just about as uh, you know, as bad as one can imagine. Um, after after I got there and talked and talked to the people that came. Became clear that this was not a question of just something you know, battlefield casualties or a um, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a tough, a tough fight. Um, it became clear that they relatively easily the, um, the Taliban had uh, regained control of the, um, the small town, um, but that they had then started rounding up, um, f uh, rounding up males uh, as a form of collective punishment. Uh, and they summarily executed them uh, in a, um, in a sense, a series of mini massacres in um, several different locations, and the whole thing was all centrally controlled. Um, and because of you know, sort of one of these you know, coincidences of timing and geography and personalities, and so people, it was possible to document this absolutely completely. Um, <coughs> When, when the controversy, when it, when it hit the radios, of course, that they, there were all sorts of expressions of concern, 
Um, the Taliban flatly denied it. It's all propaganda. The little woman declared that one is basically that you know, any um, any foreigner goes to um, goes to Yakima, that they are an enemy of the Islamic Emirate, um, which is one of those challenges you face. Um, but it was I mean, it was certainly possible for me to go there, um, cross the line, um, uh, and. Um, uh, and basically, you know, work out what happened, uh, talk to the old people involved, and put together, you know, put together everything that you could ever ask for. Um, because I was there, you know, there days after this thing happened. Literally, the, the, um, the, the blood was the blood was fresh on the snow. Um, the evidence was all intact. The, um, of course, there are no there are no real authorities there, but there was a, you know, was a senior commander who was in charge, who you know, fully cooperated, um, and also somebody who I knew you know, for quite a few years, um, uh, and all the bodies were, were available and um, very well preserved. Um, they made arrangements to, um, they have a concept of, sort of a, manat, a manat burial, which is not um, without full funeral rites and storing ready for a proper burial later. Um, it was an issue, it was an, uh, it was an issue in dealing with uh, killings in Afghanistan that they um, um, in Muslim countries that they um, uh, that um, uh, people have taught to to bury as quickly as possible and this means that often there's no opportunity for an autopsy and there's a good sensitivity in the um, exhumation um, and um, uh, trying to, to gain forensic evidence after the uh, after the event. In this case because the author the authorities and also the community were very much through this concept of a moment, um, they made arrangements and could see, see all the evidence. So, I mean, in a sense, all, all you could have wanted to pin it down um, was all there. Um, Excuse me, can I ask a question at this point? Who were the authorities? I mean, they, they come in, they, you know, the, this slaughter has, ha, has taken place, but you were somehow able to get there immediately yes. after. So, can you give us yes, more? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, you said. The, um, the reason I said that there was a, this, this accident of geography and politics and personalities that made this possible was because this was in a seesaw stage of conflict. Um, so the Taliban, the, the, the Taliban conducted this massacre essentially as a revenge for somebody having dared to rebel against them. Um, but they, they were subsequently pushed out of the area. Um, they uh, only managed to stay in there relatively briefly. And as I sort of said, we were surprised that they sort of had gone in at that time of winter at all. So they were driven out. So by the, when I went there, the authorities were the anti-Taliban resistance. The person who was the, I mean, the de facto authority in that area then was um, Karim Khalidi, who is now the, the vice president in, in Afghanistan. Then he was um, leader of the, and he was a member of the military council of the Islamic State of Afghanistan under um, uh, M. Chan Sud and Mahdi Mubarak. So at that stage, Afghanistan was contested between um, two authorities, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan and the Islamic State of Afghanistan. The, um, when, I, when I got there, it was controlled by the Islamic State of Afghanistan forces, and so Karim Khalid was, uh, uh, was in charge, which also means that they, in terms of you get, you get a, um, uh, in that sense, you know, the authorities who want this, who want this out, and um, also who don't actually have any um, uh, you know, traditional capacity whatsoever. For preserving the evidence, for example, uh, because one of the I mean, one of the uh, one of the things that there are lots of you know, there are lots of ethical issues about my God, you, know, you go and you just soak up soak up the evidence. We didn't have um, uh, you know, police forensics with you know, with us. I just basically um, you know, myself and local assistants being able to walk across the snow to to do this. Um, but this is the only way to preserve the preserve the evidence. We have to rely upon the Islamic State of Afghanistan forces actually to um, to get this stuff out of the out of the area. There's no way. There's no way that I was going to travel by land through Taliban territory, carrying all of this uh, this evidence, and quite even risk being killed myself. Um, so um, um, I um, I made arrangements for um, this to be um, trans you know, transported by the, um, the de facto authorities um, to a safe location where we passed over to one of our relatives. Um, and how many days after this had occurred were you actually there? Um, it was uh, about 10 days. 
the you know, eyes therapy within days of, again, the, they were, the Taliban only managed to hold on to the place for about a week. Um, and we, um, uh, one of the, one of the, um, uh, one of the, yeah, one of the aspects of this is that most, you know, most massacres are actually, of course, a combination of several different events. Um, particularly something like this where the, you know, the shooting had been going on in, in several different places. For example, the, um, uh, the, the commander who was in charge, um, Mullah Shahzad, he, uh, he occupied the, um, the old Oxfam office, and I used to be Oxfam representative. Sat in a, he basically sat in, in our old office, um, and uh, as they rounded uh, as they rounded people up, um, they basically brought them they brought them up before him, and he stood there and said, "Okay, move them up in the trucks, and park trucks in our um, uh, you know, in, in parking lot in front, of the, in front of the office." And some of them we never quite quite got the reason for some of them, but they um, some of them they they didn't even want to trans to uh, to transfer them to another site, they shot them there on the on the site. So this one one pile of evidence was actually behind the you know, behind the trees and from compound. But then there's another um, uh, there's another place I forgot to mention the, I just I'm just saying that again the, the example of the notes, you know, that they got in the note, notes at the time. Um, uh, also the like, significant but significant locations. There's probably access to all of these locations. They from the Oxfam office they transferred people along um, to um, uh, this Kalei al Hassan, um, which is like a, uh, a, a compound about a kilometre or so away from the, from the Oxfam office. Um, and you could see the, um, uh, I mean the stacks of bodies were gone by the time I got there. I just saw them where they were put in a hamanet. Um, but uh, you could see each spot where they carried out firing squad. Um, and uh, the um, uh, and then, f they obviously, they, the, as they completed each of the firing squads, they then basically picked up they, they picked up the bodies. And what the <laughs> what the eyewitnesses were taken by was they said they treated our bodies like we treat logs. The word they used code is a code for this. They used it's a stack of logs. They said they built a code of bodies instead of logs. Um, and so you can see where the, the these stacks um, uh, these stacks have been. Uh, and then they, after uh, after um, so th uh, three days, um, one of the one of the political figures made arrangements for people to be allowed. Actually, that they're basically the women to, uh, to be able to collect the bodies and take them uh, and take them back away from there, unpick the unpick the codes. So it's probably very able to go around all of these um, all of these sites. So I mean, just as you know, as massacres go, you get this like on you know, one of it was difficult. I mean, just you know, getting there was difficult. But once there, the the level of access, cooperation, just what it was possible to do, was beyond beyond whatever happens. You know, normally, you know, your massacres are investigated 20 years after it's happened, or um, or even a year, or whatever. And you, 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 know, you don't get when the, you know, when the, the blood is on the snow. Um, and because it was, you know, because of the good access, there were the fact there were eyewitnesses, there were even survivors. I mean, there were people they. Afghans, is, Afghans do not normally deliver the coup de grace when they conduct firing squad massacres. This is something, something which is a, uh, a sort of finding which cuts across massacres mm -hmm. which have been done in various different periods of the conflict. And the, a, one of these things that happen if you use a, you know, if you use a, you know, rapid fire Kalashnikov do, 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 across a, um, a line of men um, and you don't do the coup de grace, yeah, some people survive. It was possible to get from uh, from just about each of the actual sequences where they put ten or twelve men in a line and machine gun them. There was somebody alive. It was possible to get. It was, I was able to um, to uh, interview um, you know the, the the most horrendous eyewitnesses of all, who were the ones who actually were ended up in the first pile of bodies. The pile was left there, um, left there in the snow um, before being gathered up. And they actually managed to them to get away. Before um, before they were gathered, gathered up. So, I mean, do we have, so we got this really, really detailed eyewitness testimony, as well as the, um, uh, as well as of course the material evidence, which means you're able to actually work out the stories of 
what happened to the individuals, the people who were being targeted, but also who was doing it. There's good information on the perpetrators. Quite often, if a, if a massacre is conducted by people like a raiding party who come into town and then disappear, I mean, you know, <coughs> you, can, you can find the victim, you can see what's done, but you don't know who did it and how they related to each other. So just, sit, just you know, sitting through some of the things, and I can do that, and I can do this from memory, you know, the, you know um, uh, Mullah Shahzada was the Taliban commander who um, sat in my old office and, um, and said, you, 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 and you. And we were to talk to also you know, one or two people who were spared by him you know, for, for, for weird reasons. Um, uh, uh, and uh, Abdul Sattar was another, uh, another Taliban commander who was of a, sim of a similar rank as Mullah Shahzada, but Mullah Shahzada commanded the strike force that actually went in, recaptured the town, conducted the um, uh, conducted the killings and pulled out within three or four days. Um, Abdul Sattar was the commander who took over. Would, if they'd managed to hold out, would have been the commander who actually held the um, uh, held on to the place. So actually, there would have been even even from my team, one member of my team actually, as part of the, sort of the way that they managed to get out, actually had to go and meet with uh, I mean, Abdul Sattar. So for my team members, they were able to um, to talk about the meeting him. Mullah well, Fazl was then the um, uh, essentially, he was the, uh, the chief of army staff for the um, uh, for the Taliban. Uh, during the week that they were there, he was helicoptered into the area and he did an inspection. Um, so he's not just sort of sitting back in Kabul or Kandahar. He's actually he had he did have boots on the ground, not during the actual um, uh, the, the a a actual massacre, but um, during the days when the forces were there. Abdullah Sarad is another um, another senior Taliban field. Uh, Field commander, um, who uh, was probably one, you know, perhaps one rank lower than um, Sitar or uh, or Fazal, was present even during the during the massacre. Um, but one of the um, uh, one of the remarkable things which comes out of the testimony is that Saradi, short of mutiny, short of you know laying down his weapon and saying, "I shall not be part of this." did everything he could to mitigate the, the massacre and saved many lives. And I talked to, the way, it, it, again, there are, I mean, there are, again, in this kind of massacre where in the end we reckon about 160 men were killed in these, um, uh, in these firing squads. I mean, again, there are people who were marked out to be killed who didn't get, so sort of should have been killed but weren't killed. I mean, for example, um, the, uh, you know, the doorman of the, the OPS office, um, some of the Taliban, um, uh, some of the Taliban grabbed him, uh, uh, grabbed him just as, as they were taking control of the, uh, the town, at uh, the time when they were they were rounding up people to be killed. Um, they asked him for some dope. He reached in his pocket. <laughs> I said, you, 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 he, has, he just happened to have some dope in his pocket. He gave it. He gave it to the Taliban. So this is he said, oh, that's great. And he said, oh, and yeah, this, this will do us for a day or two. Come back in three days uh, and give us some more. And, okay. and, then, and then he said, don't come back, you'll regret it. I mean, that he, you know, he was saved. He was saved for having some dope in his pocket. Um, and we were able to document several incidents whereby, where Saradi, without, and said, he did it in such a way that, you know, that, that, you know, that I was able to document it later, but the boss didn't get to know that day. He basically turned people around and said, clear out. And it's the, it was quite remarkable, because in a sense, he was like, he, he was like a, a, a believing talent. He was sincerely, sincerely committed to the movement, and in his own way believed that the movement was a, was a moral force that had to be tough, but he didn't accept it, he didn't believe in this massacre. Um, the uh, Ustad Akbari was the, the, the political figure I said who made arrangements that um, so the bodies could be collected and taken, you know, taken back to their families. Um, uh, he was from that area, and we put in our political analysis, he was not a core talib, um, but uh, but he was collaborating with the Taliban authorities, essentially an arch rival of Karim Khalili was heading the, the anti-Taliban forces. You, know, you collaborate, you collaborate with your rival's enemy. Um, so he wasn't, 
uh, yeah, he was physically present in the town at the time of the massacre, but he was collaborating with the uh, with the authorities. And basically, they wanted his help to be able to hold on to the town. Ustad Fakuri was the was essentially assistant to um, to Ustad Akbari. Um, he brought in some of the militia that the, the Taliban relied on to try and hold on to the town. Um, so again, he was a, you know, a not a core Taliban, was a was a local. Um, Mullah Dadiullah would be one of the famous Taliban commanders who wasn't actually there during this um, this massacre in um, in January, but because it was a to and fro situation, um, the the Taliban came back again. The next time he's the one who led the forces. They you know, nobody hung around to be to be massacred when the Taliban were moving into town. So instead Mullah Dadiullah just burnt everything in sight, he just laid waste. Um, uh, and of course then there's Maluma. The, you know, was at the top of the top of the command chain, and you know, we sort of like know pretty well what the role of every one of these people was. But if you look through what actually what actually happened to them, you know, from a perspective of ten years, ten years on, Mullah Shahzada, the uh, the person who directly said, "Take him away, take him away, take him away." Um, he was picked up by the by the Americans not for the crime of perpetrating a massacre, but for being a, for being a member of the Taliban regime that, of course, that the U.S. by then had turned on uh, for harboring uh, Osama bin Laden and for being, being implicated in 9-11. Uh, so he was picked up as a senior field, field commander of the Taliban, was taken to Guantanamo, and they let him go. They subsequently let him go when they were starting to do the, um, uh, the first round of spring cleaning of uh, of Guantanamo, um, uh, I do not. I really do not know sort of the, the the basis of the determination whereby the U.S. gave him a free ticket back from Cuba. Um, but they flew him back from Cuba and they released him. He rejoined the jihad, went back into action, and was killed. In action. I am free by the U.S. Um, uh, he would, and he, you know, if, if I had to name the, the, you know, the, the person who's on our top of our list, if ever there be justice, this um, he's the one uh, who should answer first. Um, uh, anyway, it was you know, um, uh, again, he, he was a combat casualty. <coughs> um, uh, Abdul Sitar, was, who was definitely involved, but if uh, if if ever there had been justice. I would personally, I would recommend it, find out more about actually what Sitar did, um, because it's possible that he can be cleared of the initial massacre. But right until the I mean, the, the the moment the Taliban were forced out, um, there were killers killings going on, and I mean they in you know, the way you know, the way wars wars happen when the um, when the anti-Taliban resistance retook Yakalai. In January, they I mean, after the massacre, um, there was somebody was tied to my office chair, dying, had been um, had been tortured, um, uh, and uh, he expired soon after they we we took our office, um, and you know, which means that you know, torture torture was going uh, was going on until the moment Abu Sitar um, evacuated. Um, so he had a case to answer, but he was um, almost well, slightly different from the main massacre. But it's not—it's possible he's still alive. I received reports that he was killed in the um, in the bombing that happened during the initial intervention. Mullah Fazl is still in Guantanamo, and it's in the uh, yeah he's not in Guantanamo for his command and control responsibility in this massacre or other things that they did. He's in. Guantanamo because he's a senior Taliban uh, leader and the U.S. is still, uh, is still at war. How much coordination and information sharing is there between human yeah. rights groups and, and, and you know the American military? And you know, I mean, I mean, all this raises huge questions of institutional <laughs> connections and yeah. lines of communication. Yeah, let's come on to this. Let's come, that's the main, I'll, I'll, I've got a couple more. Okay. I don't have that much more to say, but okay. let's come. Let's come back to this because, of course, the key key question. Um, they. Uh, he's still there. Um, Saradi also was picked up as a senior as a senior commander, and was and he was released. He 
he was flown back in the first, I think the first batch where they had this, so that, this sort of weird thing where they, they appointed a um, former Mujahideen leader, Mujahideen as a head of a sort of council that was to promote reconciliation. And he, he and the Chief Justice received all these people, and he said, what I said, you know, you know, if you suffered at the hands of the Americans because they locked you up so dreadfully, then, you know, you know don't take it badly and be well behaved in future. And, um, uh, and sort of sent them and sent them off. He went straight straight back to, to Pakistan, went straight back into action. But actually, he and I, we, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I'm not quite sure quite how we managed to get in touch. We actually got in touch with each other. And um, precisely because my, my, all, my, all my testimony suggested that Saradi actually took a brave stance against the massacre. I deliberately maintained that contact. And I've subsequently been able to, I've so seen him a few times, met with his, met with his family. And I, mean, I would personally, you know, if I had to say, you know, the kind of thing, you know, there's, bound, there's bound to be a case to answer, but I would be happy to be a witness in the defense of, um, uh, of Saradi. I and mean, he came to me with one of the most bizarre, um, one of the most bizarre requests I ever had. He said, can you, you know, like, can you feed some information to the Americans to, like, to make sure there's some head money on my head, as it might be the best way of ensuring, <laughs> it might be the best way of ensuring if ever I do get captured, that I should be kept alive. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's the, um, um, bizarrely, bizarrely, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll pass on the message that Abdul Asardi is really important. Um, but subsequently, he was picked up by ISI and he's been disappeared. So I've, so I've been able to keep up with his, to keep up with his, um, with his family. But I mean, he's, yeah, the only half decent talent of the lot that disappeared somewhere is somewhere in a black hole somewhere in, uh, held by the Pakistan um, uh, intelligence. Ustad Akbari, who again, I. He definitely collaborated. I think that a reasonable tribunal would probably um, either never charge him or if they would, 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 would probably clear him. Um, you know, guess what? I mean, he's, he's on, he, today, Karzai is nominated as a um, member of his High Peace Council. He's also been elected to Parliament and he's on the High Peace Council. Um, who stands for Khoury in the, is actually, I think he's also, also probably in the, in the High Peace Council and is elected to Parliament. Um, there's one. One minor figure I sort of include in that list because it's an example of that they that you know, these things are never one-sided and they because I was trying to do a uh, a, a careful I mean, a, a, a careful um, uh, documentation. Ali Ahmed was actually a commander nominally serving under Khalili, part of the anti-Taliban forces, and as they recaptured Taliban, as they recaptured um, Yakalan, there was this weird incident whereby um, the uh, um, the Taliban sort of like flew in like one helicopter load of reinforcements at just the wrong moment, just when I mean basically every you know, they can't hold they can't hold the center and they let off some poor kids to go and try and find I mean, your wars wars are full of these messes. Um, uh, and so one of the I mean one of the kids, I mean he just yeah, he dropped off a helicopter and the commander's commander should never have sent him into action. Um, yeah, he's sort of like sent to the front line, he's like and he wounded within like sort of ten minutes of having been there. And they've lost the battle within an hour. I mean, they just you know that's what you know that's what war is made up of these dreadful stories. But somebody actually managed to to transport him to the hospital. And as they but as the um, the anti-Taliban forces came in, this particular commander sent he sent an advance guard into the hospital, checking for Taliban wounded, found out that he was there, had him dragged out of the um, uh, of the the hospital. Um, and the commander personally summarily executed him with a pistol um, in the, the grounds of the hospital. Um, and again, I mean, they, they, and the hospital was run by, I mean, you know, Seema Summer, who's now the head of the, um, uh, the head of the Human Rights Commission. I knew all the staff at the, at the hospital, and it was appalling. And, you know, and, yeah, and of course, I mean, as, again, yeah, I was, I, was a, I was a United Nations officer, and I confronted Khalidi and said, you know, this is a war crime, and you're men committing it, and sure we focus on the Taliban, yeah, of course I agree. And said Slam and not that long after it, he was killed in action. So he never faced justice. Then, but and his boss never made a move against him, but his boss said, Well, you know, when he was killed, his boss said, Well, it's good news, he's been killed. Um Dadiola began he uh, killed in action, not in the initial I mean he led the he led um, part of the early stages of the insurgency and was killed uh, killed in action and the lot of the is still in action, but um, but in hiding. Um, so it's, oh, I mean, the point being that I would contend this was probably one of the best documented um, uh, massacres that you know, you're ever going to get. Um, 
there's never been any formal justice, never. And the and the, you know, the, the and all this, uh, I mean, all the material evidence that, that we got, um, uh, we got handed over to um, uh, to the um, High Commissioner for Human Rights. It's all. This is all. All the, I mean, the, the the list of stuff which I gave here. Um, the, I mean, all this stuff. It's all hidden in a vault somewhere in Geneva. Um, gathering dust. I mean, like, you know, to that. Yeah, all that. I mean, the, the hats from the victims, because I mean, there's a pile of hats where they had to carry out the, the some of the executions. I mean, all the hats with holes through the, there were A1 on the ground. They're all sitting gathering dust in Geneva. Um, I was able to brief um, brief Kofi Annan. Um, and the, the way that they, you know, the pe pe you know, people who don't end up being killed like this, they end up having quite you know, long careers. That they, um, the, um, I mean, bizarrely, when when I briefed Kofi Annan on this with in summary, in summary of this stuff, um, they, I mean, of course the Taliban were waiting to give their account as well. And it was one of these one of these bizarre things because I mean the the, the Taliban official who was going to give the brief um, and I we were both being flown out of Kabul at like more or less at the same time, um, and you had this weird sort of like meeting in the corridor as you're going in to brief Kofi Annan, and I could just sort of smile and smile and say that it's my turn first, um, and I mean even and just today actually. Somebody asking me my, um, my opinion of him for, for some particular um, thing that he's up to nowadays. Um, so yeah, people have long, long careers. And guess what? When yeah, when those of us were moving into Kabul back in 2001, um, uh, having to run the gauntlet of the you know, the, the corpse slung from a uh, from a tree, um, many of the uh, of Afghans who's almost in the UN who worked with for many years, and yeah, they told us what they wanted. And I think that you know those who you know we've been, we've been actors in this for quite a while. We had hopes as well. We were not just yeah. They don't don't pretend that you're not not actors. Um, uh, and uh, I mean I think that I could speak for quite a, you know, I could name quite a few friends, both foreign and Afghan, um, who shared in these uh, in these hopes that. This, you know, the strange sequence of events which had caused the United States to intervene in Afghanistan without ever really having gone into these um, uh, into these war crimes, but still we hoped that the intervention would lead to this decisive break from the past. Um, we also hoped that the, you know, there was this very minimum that the, the, the perpetrators of crimes in a long conflict, which had multiple stages, and so of course multiple parties of the conflict had been involved in perpetrating crimes, at least they'd be excluded from positions. Um, there was this hope that they, um, the worst, would face justice, um, and of course we hoped that you know, the peace would last. Um, it never happened quite like that. Um, there was you know, never really a formal justice. Perpetrators were never excluded, and the yeah, and, um, f uh, a sort of peace only lasted for a couple of years. Um, under the heading of uh, under the heading of uh, transitional justice, various things have been tried. Of course, it's another. You know, to, if you want to get into the real proper, you know, the, the proper research piece of what's been done, there are lots of lots of others can talk that can talk to it. But examples of some of the things that were um, what were, were tried, there was an attempt, at least in parliamentary elections, to um, uh, to vet um, the, uh, the people who were going to stand. It was incredibly troubled. Um, that they, uh, um, uh, yeah, some people were kept out. Lots of people were allowed to stand in, and you got the sense that they were the rather those who were um, those who were politically insignificant, irrespective of the, the nature of the, the, the things that they've been accused of or um, evidence against them. Uh, they were excluded. Um, that they, uh, that um, those who faced the most serious charges were able to uh, were able to stand. And there are lots of questions about the whole methodology and rationale, the ethics of vetting. But I mean, it's lost on it's lost on no people who uh, thought about transitional justice that the, the president continues, like today, um, to to try and manoeuvre the one of the uh, one of the alleged perpetrators, somebody against whom there are a lot of, a lot of who's got a lot of cases to answer in the position of um, chair of the parliament, still trying to get him in there. Um, we did we did have a rather um, you know, sustained attempt to vet the police. I mean, I always, I always say. It, Try for a while and sort of beat it out. Um, there are lots of problems around it. Um, at least you can say, well, there's a human rights commission was you know, set up and it's still in action. It's done, done quite a few things. And of course, the constitution is you know, there are lots of lots of clause about human rights in the constitution. 
there was a transitional justice action plan which provided, was supposed to provide an overall framework, um, uh, providing a balance between attempts at prosecution um, and non prosecution prosecution approaches, kind of the obviously informed by best international practice and so on. Um, uh, you know, very, um, a lot of hard work went into the plan um, and into getting the, the president to adopt it as, as policy, um, but uh, most of it never saw the light of day. Um, although the plan as a whole was never implemented, there would be various exercises at, at um, truth telling. Um, there were a couple of trials in um, uh, in Kabul, very troubling trials. I actually don't think there were some, there were some international trials as well. Um, uh, but overall, you know, there's you know, a few things were tried, but never. If you were to go through the, the list of hopes that people had, it didn't happen. And certainly, you know, nothing ever happened on our massacre. Um, so. Before we get on to sort of answering you know, the, on to, on to your question, if I, to, if I just to come out with a very rapid fire on the points about why, with so many hopes, and in a sense, just like um, you know, through you know, through accidents of, of geography and politics, that they, it was possible to document this particular massacre. Um, also, through the you know, accidents, the accidents of history and the intervention of of Osama bin Laden, there was for a while an atmosphere which seemed to be conducive to. Um, to justice, justice being an integral part of where Afghanistan was going, why did it not happen? I mean, of course, the um, the um, the the first the first point was um, that it, you know, it was a military intervention. I mean, they, it was an attempt to topple a regime that was said he was deemed to have you know, to have uh, waged war in the United States. You know, of course, there was this you know, Chapter Seven um, the UN Charter. Uh, cover for going in, but the point is that they, you know, the the people who were really running the intervention were the generals, um, and they, you know, they went in with a mandate to uh, to topple the Taliban government and go after the international terrorists, um, and I mean that you know, even in the sort of days after that, you had this new bizarre attempt to try and uh, to try and um, uh, uh, you know overcome these you know, these coordination issues. The bizarre thing, I mean, they, um, uh, even Mullah even Mullah Dadiullah, uh, one of the, the senior, uh, one of the senior anti-Taliban resistance commanders, um, basically offered me Danula um, in the uh, in the days as the as the Taliban were collapsing. He had him in his clutches. Um, I said, "Well, see, 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 I see if we can find anybody who's prepared to actually take him off your hands." We couldn't get him. We couldn't get anyone. We had to let him go. It's quite bizarre. Um, uh, so, I mean, in, in a sense, that the. Um, uh, it just wasn't. I mean, it, yeah, the international military you know, could have could have done more in facilitating um, uh, justice. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think that I can imagine that it would have been very. You know, some of them would be quite happy in show trials. And show trials would be, you know, uh, been an issue. But they, uh, there was no, you know, there was no nobody had a nobody had a soft spot for the Taliban. And uh, as it seemed initially, they were going to be wiped off the face. They were not going to be a military factor in the future. They. Um, uh, yeah, it might politically have been possible if uh, if it had been a priority, but it might wasn't. Um, uh, but there was also a key thing around the, the politics of the intervention, and this is something where the I mean, people will argue about this for you know, for decades. That it was <coughs> the, the model was based upon this rapid restoration of Afghan sovereignty. Although I mean, the, you know, the, the U.S. and Allied militaries were deployed, um, uh, the the idea was that there were Afghan national authorities and they would exercise sovereignty. The, the option of the UN um, administering Afghanistan for a while was discussed and was rejected. Um, and, uh, and this is where, again, you get difference in the way people tell the story. I would say that the Afghan sovereign, uh, sovereign authorities, which basically the people who occupied the presidential palace, um, they, they believed that they, the way that they had to, to build a political base um, was by accommodating, um, uh, you know, basically another set of perpetrators. The Taliban weren't the only um, that uh, they need they needed to get the uh, the anti-Taliban armed resistance on board, um, uh, and uh, these of course included many of those who were in the uh, in this of the most lists of uh, of alleged perpetrators. Um, so this this generated this you know, the um, uh, major political obstacle uh, to doing anything which looks like transitional justice. But even if you accept that. It wasn't a uh, it wasn't a priority for the international military, and it was politically difficult for the new Afghan sovereign authorities. 
And there were very, I mean, there were very real and practical problems in any rapid move towards justice, which was the state of the Afghan justice system. Um, we actually have cases in point because two, um, two alleged perpetrators did go on, did go on trial. Um, by coincidence, one of them called Abdullah Shah was, I mean, he, uh, he was arrested on a Kabul street, I think, chasing a woman, waving while he was waving a, um, uh, a pistol because I think he wanted to, he wanted to shoot his wife. Um, but it turned out that he was actually, um, uh, you know, he faced crime, faced allegations of multiple war crimes. Um, he ended up on, he ended up on trial. And it was just an appallingly flawed trial, um, and he ended up actually being executed. He was one of the, the first, I think he was the first person that Karzai actually ordered his execution. And he was only executed because he had he knew too much about what senior perpetrators knew. The same person that Karzai is now trying to get um, get installed as chair of the parliament um, had been his boss um, and had used this man as a um, as an assassin. Um, and so we actually managed to get someone to interview him while he was actually on the um, rapid prosecutions inside Afghanistan would be a major mistake because they would not um, fulfill the, the requirements of um, uh, uh, of due process um, and would, it would make it look even worse. Um, uh, but they going beyond so going beyond the, going beyond that and going beyond the, the, the specific political problem that Karzai um, has um, uh, surrounded himself by with perpetrators. Was that actually that the um, the, the governing the governing clique that uh, was installed by the international intervention fundamentally never believed in the rule of law? Now this is of course a contention that you've got to you know you have to back up with multiple multiple examples. But the, we have multiple you know, multiple examples where they chose to um, uh, to bypass the the rule of law in cases which didn't affect um, transitional justice. So we shouldn't be surprised. Shouldn't be something that, they, in a sense, for for ongoing crimes, they specifically wanted to um, to let people off the hook. We shouldn't be surprised um, that they weren't in a hurry um, to to see prosecutions going ahead, um, or even the groundwork for prosecutions going ahead from uh, from old crimes. There's a, another one which is I mean I, I haven't I haven't heard so many other people um, argue this one, although in the previous points and many other people would argue this. There's a strange kind of um, uh, this class class warfare. But they in the, the in the discourse of some of our Afghan colleagues who have advocated moving rapidly on transitional justice and getting into prosecutions as quickly as possible. Like when they when they start to list those they consider the perpetrators, um, it starts to look like a uh, the, the educated professionals who haven't been themselves directly a part of armed groups can come up with a long list of people who are not quite so well educated have a more rural background um, and happen to have played a role in, uh, in armed groups. Um, and because there are, there, there are all sorts of class warfare dynamics underpinning um, alignments in Afghan politics, it's not surprising that, um, that then they found it difficult to get a consensus, um, to get the difficult to get to establish a position where, in a sense, everybody in parliament, even if they've had a background um, uh, in this of the, uh, the armed groups which, you know, which committed many of these things has to accept that in the time requires as a change of Afghanistan, we have to accept that. They couldn't build that kind of consensus which would have made transitional justice sort of irresistible. Um, and because uh, I've mentioned in what has been tried, there have been, there have been a handful of, of cases abroad where people, I mean, sort of significant, significant perpetrators have actually been tried under universal jurisdiction and some of them have actually have gone to jail over it. Um, but it's sort of it's sort of not satisfying because it meant that it was very much hit and miss. The very there's a right there again there's been another series of accidents which determined why some uh, some perpetrators have gone on trial and of course the vast majority have not. And I don't think that the way that selection has done or that the way that they've been conducted really has greatly consistent in sense you know, convinced Afghans that their hopes have been realised on this. Um, and of course then finally that they, um, uh, they uh, um, uh, it's not just the military who haven't pursued it as a, um, as a priority. Um, I mean it's the, you know, of course a few members of the international community have often come back to, uh, to traditional justice. Um, but uh, you know, ones who have been calling the shots have not been, um, have not had a higher list of priorities. So, which leads back to the latest question. Yes, exactly. Um, on, I mean, 
mean, uh, I, uh, yeah, of course, I've you know, brief, I brief multiple military, I think, multiple uh, military officers, but I can't. Um, uh, if you were to ask me about, if you were to ask me about, say, I don't know, like Donald Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, was he personally aware of the, um, uh, what, um, uh, what these Taliban were accused of? And the ones that he was holding in Guantanamo. I, mean, I actually don't know. I suspect. Um, uh, um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I believe in. Uh, I mean, when it, when you, if you look at the, sort of the, you know, the way the intervention worked, and the, of course we had in the UN we had multiple lines of communication open to the you know, different different bits of the military. Um, uh, I don't think. That, I mean, I don't think the. the I don't think the UN ever, um, well, even not me personally, or the U a UN as an institution, ever really so I took this as the, mo the most important thing you absolutely pursue relentlessly and get through every bit of the chain of command. Um, we certainly briefed, you know, briefed lots of people, but we never, you know, never actually, this was never the most important thing that we were trying to do that I can say with confidence that you know, we got to this state and we were blocked at this, uh, at this point. Um, but, but how, I mean, I guess then one begins to wonder how those decision making, how those decisions are made. I mean. Who decides what's going to be prioritized? And in this case, on the UN side, what what is prioritized? I mean, in some ways, I was reluctant to come to the talk because I thought that the the the, 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 the reason for lack of attention to transitional justice are, they're they're so obvious. I mean, one has only to look at Nazi, you know, the aftermath of World War II and the accommodation of Nazis by the Americans to understand what a large part of the dynamic might be. But it's interesting, given that we have now this huge apparatus of you know human rights advocates yep. and humanitarian aid and transitional justice and all this has it made absolutely no difference i mean do we have an intellectual you know an apparatus of legitimation without consequences or in fact are there pressure points you know modes of articulation that simply have gone unexploited for lack of savvy or i mean how do you understand the picture okay i think that the um, uh, part of this was definitely in the, the politics of the leadership of the intervention. That they, um, um, Dr. Rahimi went in as the special representative of the Supreme General. And um, the, I mean, you know, he and the UN team did a lot of high level consultation. And uh, um, uh, Ambassador Brahimi believed that, they, uh, that there was a conflict between uh, peace and justice, the way that this was unfolded. It sort of seems, it might seem, you know, seem bizarre to people who have you know, been involved in the debate in so many other places. Um, he believed that, uh, he essentially, he accepted the case being put by the new Afghan sovereign authorities, that um, because they were uh, politically dependent upon people who would um, be uh, present upon any reasonable list of perpetrators, uh, it was important to go slow on justice so as to um, give a chance to uh, you know, consolidate the, the post-Taliban I mean, one of the huge, you know, my, my training is in social cultural anthropology, and I know that Tom Barfield, for example, has uh, called attention to the, for many observers of Afghanistan, the sheer ludicrousness of trying to, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, assuming that, you know, sovereignty entailed a highly centralized government when nothing like that had actually ever existed in practice in Afghanistan. So, so I mean, to some extent, I mean, if, what, one of the things that's interesting about this is the kind of self, almost tautological, I mean, could you tell us maybe more about the the ambassador and you know his investment in this particular scheme? I mean, do you think, in fact, if if a more decentralized model had been envisioned, that that things might have worked out differently because there would have been more sensitivity to regional um, regional power issues and problems? I mean, 
how, how much of the, this outcome is dependent on a particular vision of the Afghan state? Um, uh, I think that uh, it is highly dependent upon the um, uh, vision of the Afghan state, but I think that uh, it's not captured in the um, uh, in, in Barfield's sort of Decentralized reality versus uh -huh. the, um, the ideology of the center, um, because it's. Um, I think the sticking point is on is on the place of justice in the state. Um, the, for example, the if the. In a weird sort of way, the uh, the Taliban were pro centralization and pro justice, mm -hmm. whereas the um, the um, the cabal that we put in power. Kabul were pro centralization and anti justice. The issue was not the um, was not uh, whether they believed that Kabul should um, should try to rule the, the whole kingdom. The issue was um, uh, whether uh, whether laws should apply to everyone. But but once but once you decided to put them in power, laws couldn't apply to everyone precisely because they had to make accommodations in order to ensure that they could remain, preserve themselves at the helm, right? Um, I mean, that that at least is a, is a fairly plausible... Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what, um, I mean, that's what uh, essentially Dr. Green concluded. Um, uh, I, um, I personally advocated a different approach, which was that uh, of trying to um, exact a price for somebody like being inside the tent, rather than rather than pursuing, um, uh, rather than to, uh, trying to put everybody on trial, mm -hmm. uh, trying to create incentives for uh, future good behaviour uh, by uh, basically putting everybody everybody who was accused of past crimes, except the absolutely worst, mm -hmm. um, on parole. The, a model whereby your um, everything will be everything will be known. You know, so that documentation go ahead. Prosecution doesn't start because they've been um, yeah, they've been paroled or, prob paroled or probation, and that anybody who steps out of line to create basically um, rebels against the new order or commits crimes against people in the new order, then that they uh, they are open to investigation for their past crimes as well. Who would go and oversee such a process? You will. Well, I mean, this is something which should have been this should, something which you know, should have been done by the Afghan authorities, supported by the UN. Immediately, which of course you get into the issues of that the Michael didn't you raise raised up around the um, which Afghan authorities? They get some. Well, no. That by this, by by the time you get to two thousand and one, there is only one set of Afghan authorities. But but you're asking the very people to implement such mm. a scheme, who in fact were already committed yeah. to a very different understanding of what their well, see, I think, I mean, this is, when you, when you start off on a journey like this, I accept that the, um, uh, I accept that the ability of key players like Lachlan like Rahimi and the U.S. Ambassador and so on to influence the direction that, of course, it, um, uh, it, um, you know, reduced over time. And that they, uh, I think you have to be extremely, extremely cautious about suggesting that this is the, Actor can really change the way that business is done inside the Afghan presidential palace in the year 2011. But I think in year 2001 and 2002, I think that's absolutely not the case. Um, they, uh, I think that they, um, uh, I think that that's the that's the time where you, know, when I talk about the, you say that you know the vision that the you know, Afghans are basically Afghans that I was telling to hang out with. Um, uh, I think that they they were buying the kind of vision, you know, vision. Um, represented by these hopes, which I mentioned earlier on, um, uh, I uh, and I should say that the, um, the my political role straight after the um, after the fall of the Taliban uh, was uh, as one of the two advisors who worked with what was then this would be the nascent um, legislative arm, the new Afghan state, it was the commission that was responsible for convening the Loy Jirga. Um, so they they held like the space in the constitutional order that would be occupied um, by the, the legislature, um, and so I mean, in a sense they yeah, they have been tasked by the Bonn Agreement 
to do a key part of shaping the new Afghanistan. Um, and I mean, I can certainly say that the, uh, um, uh, the although it was difficult, it was difficult. The, um, the, the consensus inside that um, commission uh, was would definitely be sympathetic to the vision that I talked about. In fact, even I, yeah, I would guess, although they I mean like our poet right at the start. I mean, our, you know, our poet deliberately remains anonymous, but I'm pretty sure it's one of the original commissioners. So we actually there is, I mean, there are people who are charged with putting together the new order, and these people were they were responsible for gathering the you know the representatives of the Afghan people in the this jirga that was convened after six months, which was supposed to determine the I mean, you know, so, you know, yeah, elect the, the head of state. Um, that they determined under the, under the government uh, and uh, uh, determine the future structure of Afghan government. Um, that, uh, so, and, yeah, they, which also in a sense was a legislative process in itself, even deciding how they do business was actually the first, the first bit of legislation that was being done in the Afghanistan. So that they, I mean, they had this vision. Um, and yeah, I, I saw it articulated across the countryside. I mean, they went around and they, and uh, when, when people just, you know, just you know, talk about you know, which direction Afghanistan went in. Um, if you ask a lot of these of the, the, um, yeah, the, the internationals who had, sorry, had been on the ground beforehand and st you know, stuck around and were part of this process, say up to June 2002, we had a lot of hope that it would go the direction that we were talking about. And I think that was the mood, that was certainly the mood inside the, the commission which had been charged with putting together the Lloyd Jirga. That was, uh, it certainly accounted for the mood of a lot of the people who were there in the Lloyd Jirga. <laughs> Um, but the, the, you know, the palace went the other direction, and key international players helped it to do so. And I think there was an opportunity to, um, f uh, to go, in a different, uh, go in a different direction. The, in, the, in the early conversations that led up to the lawyer journey and whatnot, the role of the, the former king, mm. was that a missed opportunity to bring somebody in there who was just beyond politics at that point? And just sort of, I mean, beyond a historical inaccuracy, he's 90 something years old. He, he wasn't going to be there long. He wasn't a real power. But could he have been used to provide the kind of umbrella under which yeah, wise men could have yeah, operated yes, better? Uh, it, was, um, uh, it was one of the possible options. But I think my, I mean, my, my <coughs> boss, Francis Vendrell, was really sympathetic to, um, to that option. Um, uh, I dealt with a lot of our fans who were supportive of it. I mean, and I mean, if you want to get, if you get an idea of like the, the way the, the personalities work out in this kind of thing, I mean, they, uh, it was you know, the U.S. rep Khalil Zad who basically helped kill the idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's famous. Uh, yeah, that's that's a part of the historical record. Um, uh, and I mean, I know there's. I mean, I know, I'm familiar with the case for and against. But I mean, I can. There was one. There was one stage there when this. Again, go back to the poem. You remember this this person that Fahim that the, is being played on, uh, played on by the uh, the poet. I mean, at one stage, um, uh, the I mean, yeah, yeah, my boss, the um, uh, Rahimi, this you know, this rep who uh, thought that let's have peace, let's establish peace now, and justice will come in good time. Um, uh, I mean, yes, he yeah, actually called me to say that yeah, there, are <laughs> there are death threats. Um, yeah, there are death threats against you from Fahim. What do you suggest doing? I said, I've got to talk to him about it. Um, and uh, the. Uh, and so I did. I went. I went and talked to uh, Fahim about it. Um, and uh, the and funny enough, what was on his mind was that he was actually um, damn determined that the monarchy should not be re-established. Um, and it was a really? there wasn't yes there wasn't. I mean there, there was there, I mean there was a group of the, you know, the there was a group in the new order who felt that um, they felt sort of like fundamentally threatened by the um, uh, return of the king. Um, uh, they might have, I mean, you know, with hindsight, some of them might have thought about it, uh, thought about it differently. There was a case for, and there was a case against. Mm -hmm. But in the end, and in the end, the um, people like Fahim uh, certainly, certainly are argued against, um, and the U.S. And the U.S. Rep, um, uh, um, uh, that he did the, I mean, he, he axed the idea and made sure there was one. Is there any chance today of creating some sort of website in which you 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 know you give all the credible information of, uh, you know that that you have from you know, this earlier period and kind of set up 
you know, a way of accessing information so that, in fact, Afghans can see what the record was and kind of from a kind of civil society standpoint perform the monitoring that you suggested should have been institutionalized within the parliament itself? Yeah, we're, um, uh, uh, several organizations that have um, done sort of similar work are cooperating on to try and have a um, uh, sort of project based around Marxists so that they, um, f uh, using you know, servers, servers located in appropriate places, um, pooling this, this kind of thing from multiple sources um, in, a, in a platform that everybody, uh, that everybody can access who's at least is looking for uh, in transitional justice. Um, uh, USIP has been sort of taking the lead and trying to, to coordinate, uh, uh, coordinate the, um, the, the artist's work. Um, uh, and yeah, they, you know, don't, um, uh, you know, it, it says transitional justice hasn't died in the sense that there are people who are struggling on and trying, uh, uh, trying to do this. Um, uh, but it just says, no, it's, you know, it's not part of the central, the central piece. And, that, uh, and I think the idea of having, uh, I think a, decentral, a decentralized approach to the um, generation and dissemination of information makes an awful lot of sense. Um, in the, uh, and I think that the uh, other aspects of the experience would really bear that out because when there have been attempts at like, centrally mandated and organized truth seeking, um, you know, guess what? They get stuck on all these political problems, they, I mean, which yeah, should have been obvious, but people still can. You know, Obviously, when you've got, you know, we have centralized international institutions. You, you know, we have the one commissioner for human rights. Uh, so the commissioner for human rights sort of, you know, help gets involved in sort of like mandating a process. Then you sort of end up with something that you like, like you end up with a centralized process. And at some stage, somebody goes along to the presidential palace and says, oh, we're thinking of releasing this report. And the, fair, and the president, oh my God, please don't. Mm -hmm. um, and because everybody is um, uh, dependent upon maintaining a good working relationship presidential palace. Um, I mean, even good, I mean, even in the, in the era of WikiLeaks, I mean, good human rights workers end up um, uh, at least, you know, facilitating some level of suppression. So that's what we've had on century. There's, I mean, there's a one a major report called the, the, uh, the Mapping Exercise, um, which covered a lot of the, you know, obviously, this, this thing that I talked about is only one example. There are multiple um, uh, things like that have been documented over the years. Um, for, uh, some very, very effective people, you know, Put together a lot. Yes, the Encyclopedia of War Crimes in Afghanistan, um, uh, yeah, implemented by the Office of the High Commissioner. Was the first. Bizarrely, and there's another one which the the, um, the Human Rights Commission has been working on for the past couple of years. It's it's ready and it's currently. I mean, everybody's agonising over. Oh my God! Now we've compiled it. What do we do with it? So I think that the I think dissemination's got to be decentralised. I think that if you want. If you'd ask me about, so yeah, okay, give us some examples of things, some things that have worked. And the fact that there is a, you know, there's a new media that not everybody can control. And every now and then, transitional justice type things, truth telling, getting the story out, pops up in the new media. So you get radio. So for example, with one of the, um, one of the, one of the trials that I've been involved in as a expert witness, um, uh, happened in the in the old baby. One of the things that struck me about that trial was not the fact that I mean some you know, guy ends up actually. You know, up in British jail, but actually it became the hottest topic on Afghan radio, and people were prepared to come out and talk about it, and ah, that's good. Sorry, well, just related to that, do you think that there's any, um, what are the prospects for this preliminary examination that's just been broken by the ICC, do you think that something that might help the efforts, or that can be easily brushed away? Um, yeah, I, um, Sure. I mean, it would be very interesting when I am in Afghanistan decided to, um, to to sign up to the you know, statute. That they, uh, I got the impression that the you know, people deciding to sign probably were fairly confident that we never, you know, that we never have impact. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have you followed exactly exactly what they are going for? Because they, my, the original understanding was that obviously the real world statute wouldn't ever be able to be applied backwards to um, these kinds of events, and that they would only end up, end up using it for. Um, uh, in fresh crimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I do know that what has been, you know, this preliminary information is a bit of a new tool that we're yeah. now yeah. and who needs 
it may not end up becoming a real case because the judge is not open, but as a sort of as an exercise of just the examination itself and you know, being used for truth telling or being used to help the yeah. civil society. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the I have to go and check the the period of the um, the, the crimes that they're looking at because the um, the colleagues who you know, right from the start lobbied with the ICC to try and get um, mm -hmm. the company to take up something. They deliberately went for post two thousand and one crimes and mm -hmm. up, you know, um, basically after 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 Afghanistan became a signatory to the statute. Um, which it can be good in itself and it sort of it, it raised another bit of the transitional <coughs> justice that they you know for that they it's sort of all been thought of crimes of the past so you sort of deal with those as a way of building a sort of a just and prosperous future. And it's always thought, and it's sort of often thought of in a post-conflict situation. But of course, Afghanistan is neither post-abuse nor post-conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a very practical dilemma that people who've worked in this field have faced. Oh my God, when do we start taking new cases? And of course, yeah, 10 years ago, I think <coughs> pretty much everybody started taking new cases. Mm -hmm. But if, if you were to put all this information in, into a website, so to suggest and so on, first of all, do people in Afghanistan genuinely care and are they not so overwhelmed by this kind of thing? Are they going to act on it? And if they do act on it, do you not run the risk of, as just you could term, um, to provide information for fresh crimes? I'm not, I'm not saying suppress it. Uh, yeah. Not at all. I believe the information should be out, but I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, I mean, do, uh, do our firms care? I mean, there's, you know, there's lots of evidence to suggest that they, um, uh, that uh, Afghans care passionately about justice and the people who feel that they have been mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, victims of injustice, that they, uh, they care about it. They sometimes are deeply cynical about the prospects of ever actually seeing justice, but any time they're asked, they say they desire it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are also, um, the, the, uh, there are also many traditions of, um, uh, of you know, forgiveness, of getting uh, of, um, uh, getting uh, beyond um, in being a victim, um, uh, but there are also there's lots of even you know, there's lots of Islamic jurisprudence about how much they like to do that. The victims got the right to do that, nobody else can do it on their, uh, on their behalf. Um, so I think this is still I mean, people still do care about this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they, um, uh, but saying that they care about it isn't, doesn't necessarily mean that they believe that you know, somebody has to go through the historical record of who's in the pick and identify um, everybody who's involved in certain categories of um, uh, war crimes and uh, the yeah, moral trial. I mean, the, uh, uh, there is often a lot of factors and I just need to figure out how to do it. The very minimum is that um, most people that I, that I talk to at least they want to see the truth out there. Whether they, you know, they may reserve the right to forgive, mm -hmm. um, but they, they want the truth. Mm -hmm. The review process by the ICC in Kenya gives very little hope that anything will come of the process, and, and in part precisely because of the I item here, the justice system in Kenya is so flawed that in fact many people apparently in Kenya hope that, the, that, that nothing will be done by the authorities because they feel that, that the authorities are so, that the results would be so negative that they want the ICC to prosecute, which of course, you know, given the ICC's limited capacity and the scale of the problems in Kenya, you know, is, is a, a hopeless wish. So, you know, I have, um, uh, and yeah, of course, I mean, the Kenya stuff is a sense is also quite fresh. But uh, it's interesting that we, we do have the case study from Afghanistan of, um, uh, you know, other jurisdictions getting involved in this because of the So rather than just looking to what you know, uh, Ocampo might do, I think we should try and learn, learn from uh, what's <coughs> been done when, uh, you know, uh, when courts in Europe have actually uh, taken up some of these issues. And, um, uh, yeah, and it's, sor it's sort of a mixed record. I mean, they, there have been convictions. Um, they, uh, it's been very difficult and um, not entirely satisfying. And, that there is a, and there is this major issue about, um, yeah, how well are the greater issues of justice served um, if a tiny unrepresentative um, minority right. 
perpetrators can be um, uh, brought before the court. Uh, and will that and will that court provide a kind of a arena in which which people may have this, and which people feel that both truth has come out and justice has been done? Um, because it's very complicated. Um, for you know, um, satisfying all the evidentiary requirements. The, and the, uh, interestingly, with um, the, the, the two trials of Commander Zardat, um, who was somebody who was not a not just a minor figure, he was sort of almost symbolic uh, of one pattern of um, abuses that went on during the um, uh, early 90s. Um, so when he was put on trial in the old lady, the first and the first trial didn't produce a verdict, and it went to a retrial. Um, and it was, fine. it was to do with the, the difficulty that the police had faced in, um, uh, in their, uh, their investigation and their extent to, to draw upon the right kind of in-country assistance. Um, they did secure a conviction the, um, the second time round. And I mean, certainly I think that they, you know, you know, many Afghans appreciated that in the radio discussions and so on. Um, after that, and people did get a chance, and, you, know, um, you know, survivors and witnesses got their day in court um, uh, to explain it. But um, um, as somebody who went through that, I mean, I, I, I just know how extremely difficult it was to, it was to do, um, and how there can be as like a mismatch between what Afghans consider to be truth and what can be acceptable in the old way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and sometimes, I mean, yeah. And, Sometimes they, I mean, I was, it's not. It's not just that you, know, you couldn't get everything on record. Sometimes, I mean, things were accepted in the old days that the United States felt they are not that reliable. Um, uh, so uh, I don't. I mean, I just. Do, I do not. Do not think that you should expect too much justice from uh, expecting international prosecutions, particularly in the kind, this kind of conflict where you've got um, multiple alleged perpetrators rather than very small, well defined, everybody understands kind of one, two, three, four. So that they, um, I mean, even the, for, for example, when the um, UNDP Human Development Report um, made some points about the informal justice system and talked about the, um, it's the, main, the main address for dispute resolution and for uh, dealing with a certain kind of case in the, in the country um, was the, uh, the informal justice system, the use of case studies and so on. I mean, they, they were summoned by the Supreme Court. Uh, more is told you know, to recant or be thrown out. <laughs> this, um, uh, that, I mean, the, the, it's that sensitive. Um, so uh, they, uh, it definitely does happen, and uh, I mean, that is the way that um, the most current uh, issues are dealt with. Um, but uh, I don't, don't believe anybody's ever really tried to sort of come up with a, an old case load and take it to informal justice. And if you want to get to the, if you want to know what the real, what the, what the informal. Um, uh, justice approach to this um, legacy of um, legacy of crimes that uh, people have not been able to uh, to stomach and deal with. Um, they uh, um, uh, um, 
a significant number of people on the old perpetrator list have been, they've been murdered. Revenge killings. And that's, that, that's the other form of justice. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we did in the AS, you know, somebody done a lot of you know, human rights documentation, one of those, one of the, another of the, um, the sort of senior commanders who, um, you know, reached a nice fact, nice fact file on things that he'd been um, involved in over a period of 20 years, and he got, he got himself elected to, uh, elected to Parliament. You know, one uh, one fine day, um, uh, somebody um, uh, somebody walked up to him at his house and shot him down. And they uh, and it's happened to quite a few other perpetrators. They, I mean, if you were to tabulate, you yeah. know, so the you know the, the handful of cases that have been dealt with in either a uni universal jurisdiction or uh, in Afghanistan, and then things that have been solved otherwise, there's a longer list of people who have been murdered by the victims or by the heirs of the victims. Justice is big business, so I'm sure the courts don't want big cases going to some non-judicial system. Yeah, yeah, yes. the, the, you know, when I talked about the, um, this is the, the class war aspect of yeah. the uh, the calls for transitional justice, um, you know, you can apply a class war analysis to the um, uh, to the, the formal justice system as well. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, we can't let anybody else do it. <laughs> This is amazing. I've never heard of the Afghanistan massacre. I've worked in Afghanistan for about five and a half years. And, um, it, it doesn't surprise me. I've, I've heard about other things like it, but I haven't been a journalist for many years. I just see this as, as an ideal kind of frontline program where you've got, have you got video of the yeah. massacre? Yeah. Okay. So you have that kind of stuff showing what happened. And, and, the, and the point of telling the story these many years later is to say this is the foundation on which the present situation of Afghanistan is built, hence the problems we're facing there. And, and when you track those half dozen individuals as you did for us today, my goodness, that is a riveting hour of television that, that would get that story out there, but it would also make it difficult for you if you're the principal storyteller or the principal interviewee to go back, I would think. <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> problems, I understand. I know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm free. Yeah, but are, are you, yeah, it's true. But have you, have you sought out that kind of... Um, no, the, um, uh, I... Um, Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I keep, uh, I keep busy. Anyway. Well, I know that, yes, yeah, yeah. But has anyone approached you on this? Or, I mean, it's, it, to me, it's, 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 you, you, you've um, already, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So um, some of it, I think, some of it is written up in um, uh, in uh, what's your colleague down here? Uh, how we missed the story. Um, Roy Gutman, Roy Gutman had written some mm. of this up, mm -hmm. uh, but, mm. um, but not. But they, from the, I mean, I think what because um, yeah, because time moves on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that nobody nobody has covered the, I mean, this this issue about you know, is what happens to. Them. Yeah. Uh, to the perpetrators and those persons. But again, it's what happens or what didn't happen after the Akalai's yes. has left us exactly yes. where we are now, or at least that would be my way of trying to frame it. To the so, I think that show would also bring that, that, that element of the combination with the Afghans and the US would be very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because we don't have, we've had this thing where the, 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 I think the people who are in Guantanamo that want to stay Afghans and the, the US and what they're trying to do. Be soft on you if it's not the more trying to war crimes, but the um, but you know, the, the issues definitely arise because like you know, last week um, you know, this High Peace Council and President Karzai started calling for the you know, the, the release of Mullah uh, Khair So media amongst like this again the you know, the you know, my circle you know, is all and um, of course we can say okay you know what do we have on Mullah Khair should we you know, Directly implicated in some the well documented crimes, whereas if they if they sent the same letter to the president, they would respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Sayaf's lieutenant was yes. tried under the shot and, and killed under yes. the shot. Okay, yes. and um, did I understand you to say today that somebody interviewed him, perhaps yourself? No, it wasn't. It wasn't myself. It was a colleague. Where is that testimony? Where, what, 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 
that's all that's all available. So you, um, I'm not sure whether it might, might might get into our monitors database. Could a journalist have access to it? And would it um, would it provide hardcore data on SIAP that would be interesting to raise at this time? While he's being proposed as speaker. Why I um, uh, was very, you know, was very careful in the, in, the, in my explanation of why uh, why this didn't happen, and I said that the, the, the sovereign Afghan authorities um, uh, essentially they shaped this political strategy of accommodation, as a, because of the if you, if you like, so if you read Ahmad Rashid, mm -hmm. he will say the United States funded the warlords and therefore forced and uh, forced Ahmad Karzai. To um, accommodating with them. So, two different tellings of the story. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it's something sort of has got to be, um, uh, be sort of like pursued empirically. Um, I think that Karzai's moves to get Sayaf in as parliamentary speaker are simply a continuation of what he's been doing right since November 2001. Uh, and it's one of the ones where it's very easy to show that you know, the United States and international actors are Exaggerates the extent to which the US laid down 